Welcome to Marginal Investigations. I'm your host, J.W. Rich, and this is The Horrors of Hyperinflation. That's at the moment a story, but it's not a story which does not have some uh, examples in history. Inflation is a disease. It's a dangerous disease for a society. It is sometimes a fatal disease for a society. It's a disease that, if allowed to rage unchecked, can destroy a society. And we have many such examples. Imagine with me for a moment that one day you wake up, you get out of bed, you look over to your nightstand, and you notice that your wallet has a very strange-looking device attached to it. On top of the wallet is a note. The note reads, if there is anything left in this wallet by the end of the day, it will be automatically incinerated. Now, as ridiculous as this might be, in such a situation, what would you do? Well, assuming that you can't remove this device from your wallet, and you believe that whoever wrote this nefarious letter is telling the truth, then you would probably go about trying to spend your money as quickly as possible. If it's all going to be gone at the end of the day, there's no reason to hold on to it. There's no reason to save any of it. At first, you probably start with buying everything you can think of that you would want. Maybe some necessities, some food, clothing, things like that, that you would need in the immediate future, as well as maybe some things that you would just put off purchasing, things you might buy one day and just never got around to it. After that, you would move on to just whatever comes across your mind that you would want to buy, assuming you still have some money left, just whatever you come across in the grocery store or the electronic store that looks interesting to you, just throw it in the cart, might as well, right? And then, assuming you still had some money left to spend, you would just start buying anything you can think of, anything that you can see, even if it's not something you want. After all, if you have that thing, then you might be able to trade it in the future for something that you actually do want. Now, this situation, as ridiculous and far-fetched as it might be, is not too dissimilar to what people living under hyperinflation deal with every single day. Hyperinflation is peculiar, because there isn't one agreed-upon definition for the term. The concept itself is straightforward enough. Hyperinflation is like regular inflation, just much faster. Well, how much faster? Again, there's not a hard set definition, but any inflation rate over 100% or so is generally considered to be hyperinflationary. Now, inflation in its non-hyper form is bad enough. An increase in the supply of money leads to an increase in prices. As a result, everything becomes more expensive, and everyone starts to feel a squeeze on their finances. Money just doesn't go as far as it used to. Hyperinflation does all these things as well, just in a more accelerated and exaggerated form. Under hyperinflation, prices increase constantly. The money you have in your wallet, your bank account, and hiding under your mattress loses value seemingly every minute of every day. Goods often become scarce, as everyone scrambles around to buy whatever they can get their hands on, and as a result, standards of living drop off precipitously. The most obvious result of this calamity is economic chaos. However, hyperinflation also engenders cultural destruction and social erosion as well. Hyperinflation targets not only people's wallets, but also their very sense of shared identity. Suffice it to say, hyperinflation is serious business. There are several famous examples of hyperinflation throughout history. Zimbabwe from 2007 to 2008 is probably the most well-known recent example. Currently, Venezuela is undergoing a currency depreciation which is on par with hyperinflation standards. However, the most famous case of hyperinflation, and the main focus of our study today, is the German Weimar Republic. The Weimar hyperinflation is such a compelling period of history for multiple reasons. The state of the country of time, the history leading up to the hyperinflation, and ultimately what became as a result of it. We'll be looking at the history of the Weimar hyperinflation, but also studying what did the hyperinflation meant for the people that lived under it, how did it affect their daily lives, and what was it like to really live during this time in history. The main source I'll be drawing on today is When Money Dies by Adam Ferguson. It's the best overall book on the Weimar hyperinflation, and I recommend it if you're interested in this topic and want to do some more reading. With that being said, let's begin. In 1914, all of Europe was at war. It wasn't just any war, it was a war the likes of which no one had ever seen before. For almost a century, there had been no general war in Europe involving multiple great powers, and no small effort had been made to try to preserve the peace during that time. 
When the war did break out, most people expected it to be over fairly quickly. The idea being circulated at the time was that all the soldiers would be home by Christmas. By the end of 1914, however, millions were already dead, and it was clear that the war was not going to be over any time soon. Both the Entente and the Central Powers had ground each other into a stalemate, and in order to try to reduce casualties as much as possible, both sides had started digging in. The result was that all of the major powers were simultaneously faced with the same problem. How are they going to pay for all of this? Every single soldier you put in the field has to be fed, they have to be clothed, they have to be given equipment, they have to be given ammunition, and none of this stuff comes for free. All of it has to be paid for by the respective governments. Just take the artillery, for instance. On the Western Front alone, an estimated 1.5 billion shells were fired during the course of the entire war. Well, how do you pay for all of that? Where do you get the money to fund this kind of death and destruction? All of the major powers were faced with the same problem, and they came to more or less the same conclusion. Some of the money they would raise through taxation, some of it they would get through borrowing and government bonds, and some of it would be through inflating the money supply. As a result, taxes were raised, debt was issued, and the gold standard, which had limited the ability of governments to print more money, was suspended. However, Britain and France had one advantage that Germany did not. They had access to international financial markets, specifically the United States. While Germany could issue bonds for its own people to buy, it was limited in the amount of debt that it could issue to be purchased abroad. Thus, in the trifecta of taxation, debt, and inflation, Germany was limited in the amount of debt that it could issue. Because the German government didn't wish to increase taxes on the German people to help pay for the war, the slack had to be picked up by printing more money. Up to the beginning of the war, the German government had been restricted in the amount of money that it could print by the Bank Law of 1875, which stated that at least one-third of all German notes had to be covered by gold. This posed a problem, because unless there was an increase in the amount of gold in Germany, that means that there would be a limit to the amount of paper money that could be printed as well. The German government then decided to do what all governments do during times of crisis. They ignore laws and restrict freedoms. Specifically, they ignored the bank law and restricted the German people's freedom by suspending the gold standard. While the paper bank notes that the German people held were still, in theory, tied to gold, the reality on the ground was that any redemption of those banknotes for their gold value was forbidden. The German government needed to print money in order to finance the war, and print money they did. Over the next four years, the German people slowly saw the prices of goods increase and the value of the money in their wallets decreasing more and more. Even so, Germany would eventually lose the war. By 1918, they were forced to sign an armistice to end the fighting. Negotiations for what would become the infamous Versailles Treaty would continue on until 1919. Even at this point in the immediate post-war period, the inflation in Germany was already noticeable and unmistakable. The German unit of currency is the mark, and in 1914, before the war started, one British pound was worth approximately 20 German marks. By the end of the war in 1918, however, the value of the mark had been cut in half, with one British pound being worth approximately 43 marks. The value of the German mark would continue to decrease into early 1919, with one British pound being worth around 60 German marks. From here, the mark's value would absolutely plummet. By the end of 1919, one British pound was worth around 185 German marks, a decrease in value of almost 70%. Along with the monetary chaos in Germany was chaos of every other kind as well. In the aftermath of the war, Germany was shaken to the very core of its being. The German military, which had been thought by the German people to be undefeatable, had been broken and destroyed by the Entente forces. The Kaiser, which had previously been the symbol of national unity throughout all the German states, had been forced to resign his throne, and a democratic government was elected in his stead. The election of this new democratic government would officially kick off the era of Weimar Germany. From the very beginning, however, the new republic was embroiled in turmoil and strife. Losing the war had greatly destabilized the entire country, and the political scene had now polarized into two broad camps, the communists and the nationalists. To be clear, there were still lots of people in Germany that had no sympathy for either side, but these were the only two politically active and viable factions at the time. One of the effects of the Great War was an increase in the popularity of communism, 
The First World War is famous for its butchery, stalemate, and catastrophic but ultimately meaningless loss of life. All of these sacrifices that the soldiers were being asked to make might have been tolerable if they felt that they were actually resulting in something. Many soldiers were of the opinion, however, that no such results existed. The entire war was, more or less, completely meaningless. The communists took advantage of this situation, and by the end of the war, communist pamphlets and propaganda were scattered throughout the trenches of Europe. The most successful of these communist movements would be the Bolsheviks, who would seize power in late 1917 and would establish the USSR. We can look back today with hindsight, knowing that the Bolsheviks would be the only successful communist movement in the aftermath of the war. However, at the time, it was a very real and tangible possibility that a communist wave would sweep across all of Europe. Indeed, this was exactly what Lenin and Trotsky and many of the other Bolsheviks were hoping would occur. They didn't want the revolution to remain in Russia, they wanted to extend it into nations beyond. In January of 1919, just two months after the Treaty of Versailles had been signed, that's just what the communists in Germany tried to do. From January 5th to January 12th, armed communist militias would battle on the streets against government police forces and nationalist paramilitary units. While this attempted revolution would ultimately be unsuccessful, the communists would still remain a potent political force, particularly in the industry-heavy region of the Ruhr Valley. Not to be outdone, however, a year later the nationalists would attempt a coup of their own, in what would later become known as the Cap Putsch. On March 13, 1920, German army units and officers, the vast majority of which held sympathies with the nationalists, took over and occupied government buildings in Berlin. They then proceeded to declare a new government to replace the weak and ineffectual Weimar regime. At this point, it looked like the Cap Putsch might ultimately be successful. However, after wide-scale demonstrations and labor strikes, the nationalists were forced to compromise with the old Weimar government and hand over the reins of power. The Cap Putsch failed not because the German people had any love for the Weimar government, but because they just viewed it as being the new status quo. Like it or not, this was just the way things were now. This constant political turmoil wasn't doing any favors for the mark either. 1920 and 1921 would see the value of the mark deteriorate even more, with the exchange rate dropping to 240 marks for one British pound by the end of 1920 and 712 marks for one British pound by the end of 1921. By this point, the inflation was unavoidable and unmistakable. From 1914 to the end of 1921, the mark had lost almost 98% of its value. Looking back in hindsight, it's obvious to us today what the cause of this inflation was, money printing by the German government. However, to the German people living at the time, this fact was not so obvious. While this was partly due to incomplete information, it was largely the result of good old-fashioned economic ignorance. Ludwig von Mises was an Austrian economist living in Vienna at the time, and was witnessing all of the events as described. In his book, Omnipotent Government, The Rise of the Total State and Total War, Mises states that one of the most popular explanations for the inflation was Germany's balance of payments. In other words, there was more money coming into the country than there was money going out of the country. The result is an increase in the amount of money being held by Germans, which manifests itself in higher prices, which ultimately leads to inflation. This explanation does get one thing right, there's just too much money in the country. However, it's not the fault of international financial markets, but the German government and its incessant money printing. Another popular explanation was that the inflation was all the result of the money changers, or financial speculation. Hidden within this accusation, oftentimes, was an even darker accusation. The inflation was all the result of the Jews. We'll be coming back to the connection between inflation and anti-Semitism more later, but for now just keep it in the back of your mind. 1920 and 1921 had been absolute disasters for the value of the mark. However, it would be in 1922 that the descent towards hyperinflation would truly begin. As the inflation accelerated, the German people began to feel its effects, not only economically, but culturally as well. Adam Ferguson writes, quote, In the spring of 1922, Germany was evincing many signs of national despair. It was apparent to most that under the imperial dispensation, the nation had at least been confident as well as prosperous. What was disturbing at any rate to the older generations of the upper and middle classes was the realization of the superficiality of Prussian culture. 
Younger people, some of whom later remember those years not as a nightmare but as an adventure, were mainly confused and disillusioned. The self-confidence of the country ebbed away along with its prosperity, and as it did so, the moral degradation of the country and its institutions set in. Pessimism and restlessness grew as a sense of security, community spirit, and patriotism dwindled. This sense of pessimism was also shared by the state authorities. In May, the Rhineland High Commission released a report on the state of the mark and the outlook for the future. It stated that, quote, The big interests believe that as the mark is doomed as a currency beyond hope of recovery, all efforts to support it are costly, useless, and dangerous to their, or as they put it, the country's interest. This negative view of the mark would ultimately prove to be correct. The mark had ended 1921 at 712 marks to one British pound. However, that value would quickly deteriorate even further. By the end of March 1922, the mark was trading at one British pound to 1,485 German marks. However, there would be no rest for the weary. By the end of July 1922, the mark was trading at one pound to 2,975 German marks. For those of you keeping score at home, that means that the mark had lost half of its value over the course of just four months. By the end of August 1922, the mark was trading at one pound to 8,850 German marks. For those of you still keeping score at home, that means that the mark had lost two-thirds of its value over the course of just one short month. By the end of the year, in December 1922, the mark had fallen all the way down to one British pound for 39,000 German marks. This means, over the course of 1922, the German mark lost 98% of its value. Now, the inflation was intolerable in its own right, but to make matters worse, wages were not able to keep up with the constant increase in prices. Ferguson reports that by the end of 1922, prices had increased approximately 1,500-fold from the end of the war. However, the wages of the best-paid workers, which were miners in the Rhine Valley, had increased by only 200-fold. The result of these diminished wages was that standards of living were starting to decline. A report from the city of Pankow showed that 25% of children were leaving school below normal weight, and 30% were unfit to work for health-related reasons. 1922 also ushered in an important shift in the German psyche. They started moving away from paper money and towards real values. In this inflationary environment, those who could live most comfortably were those who could live off the land or held durable assets like real estate. For those without these privileges, however, it became increasingly important to exchange your paper money for goods and services as quickly as possible. Because of the money's rapidly decreasing purchasing power, there was, quite literally, no point in saving your money. Because of this, it was imperative to quickly exchange your paper money for any goods or services you can get your hands on. Even if it wasn't something that you particularly liked or wanted, at least you might be able to trade it with someone else for something you actually do want later on down the road. In this way, barter started making a limited return back to Germany as the money became less and less usable. Another peculiar phenomenon to emerge around this time was that the increase in prices started to outpace the increase in the money supply. This occurs whenever people setting prices in the present start to anticipate increases in the money supply in the future. In other words, businessmen know that there's going to be an increase in the money supply in the near future. This increase is going to take the form of an increased demand whenever people show up on their doorstep with newly printed banknotes looking for goods and services to buy. The businessmen, by increasing their prices in the present, are trying to get ahead of this curve. This has the unfortunate effect of putting even more pressure on the government to continue printing money. This, in turn, puts pressure on the businessmen to increase their prices even more. And so it goes on and on and on. Ludwig von Mises referred to this phenomenon as the crack-up boom. 1922 was an absolute disaster for the German people. However, 1923 would go down in history as the year of hyperinflation. The year would be kicked off to an ignominious start as on July 9th, French forces invaded the Ruhr Valley in western Germany. As part of the infamous Versailles Treaty that Germany had agreed to to end World War I, they had to pay reparations to all the Entente powers. Most of these reparations were in the form of cash payments, but some of them were also in physical goods, like coal and timber. Well, Germany had gone without handing over any of these physical resources for quite some time. 
As a result, the Reparations Committee, which was overseen by British and French officials, decided that Germany was now in voluntary default. They were determined to get these resources one way or another, so they decided, why not just cut out the middleman? If Germany was no longer going to cooperate, then they would ensure that Germany's cooperation would no longer be necessary. As a result, on January 9th, French forces invaded and occupied the Ruhr Valley to directly take the resources for themselves. This had the effect of pulling the floor out from under the mark, leaving it in absolute freefall. At the end of 1922, one British pound was equal to 39,000 German marks. By the end of January, just one month's time, one British pound would be equal to 225,000 German marks, a decrease in value of over 83% over the course of just one month. Even so, the occupation of the Ruhr Valley did have a unifying effect for the German people. Ever since the end of the war, Germany had been bitterly divided along political and ideological lines. Resisting the occupation of the Ruhr Valley was the first thing that everyone could agree upon. Ferguson comments on the effect of the Ruhr invasion, writing, quote, It is a phenomenon of any national group that, almost however much it is riven with dissent, an external threat will unite it. By all accounts, the entry of the French and Belgian armies into the Ruhr had a galvanizing effect on a disintegrating German nation. Not only did all of Germany rally at once to the notion of supporting their brothers on the Rhine, the socio-political fever in the industrial areas itself subsided in a torrent of national passion directed against the common enemies. The occupation of the Ruhr Valley would require a podcast all on its own. However, suffice it to say, it unified the German people together as well as bringing about a wave of nationalism throughout the country. In fact, many nationalist figures would make appearances and give speeches in the Ruhr Valley. One of these was a young, ex-soldier named Adolf Hitler. We'll talk more about him later. The occupation of the Ruhr Valley would ultimately last until 1925. While there was initially much resistance from the German people to the occupation, the events of the next several months would destroy any strength the Germans had to keep up the fight. Eventually, much like the Weimar Republic itself, it was simply accepted as the new status quo. During the Marx Freefall in January of 1923, one of the most ominous signs of the hyperinflation to come was introduced. For the first time ever, a 100,000 mark note was being printed by the Reichsbank. Never before had there been such a high denomination banknote in Germany's history. However, the 100,000 mark note would quickly be dethroned, as three weeks later, a 1 million mark note was officially printed for the first time. These two would only be the first of many new banknote denominations that would come about during the hyperinflationary spiral in 1923. Despite its horrendous start to the year, the mark managed to hold much of its value over the course of the next several months. By the start of June 1923, the mark had fallen to only 265,000 marks for one British pound. However, it was not to last. From this point on, the mark would be absolutely decimated. By the end of June, the mark closed at 900,000 marks for one British pound. From here, it was a sharp descent downward. By the beginning of August, the mark was at 4,500,000 marks for one British pound. By the end of August, it would be 50 million marks for one British pound. From this point forward, Germany was undeniably in the throes of hyperinflation. Hyperinflation entails a very unique set of circumstances, which in turn entails a very unique set of experiences. This is revealed in the kind of stories that come out of hyperinflationary periods. For instance, there was a journalist by the name of Eugenie Shamar who was living and writing in Germany around this time. In February of 1923, he wrote to a friend describing all of the events that he was seeing around him, and he writes, quote, the price of tram rides and beef, theater tickets and school, newspapers and haircuts, sugar and bacon is going up every week. As a result, no one knows how long their money will last, and people are living in constant fear, thinking of nothing but eating and drinking, buying and selling. There's only one topic on everyone's lips in Berlin, the dollar, the mark, and prices. Have you seen this? For heaven's sake, stop. We have today similar accounts and memoirs from many other people who were living during that time. One of particular interest gives us insight into the way that workers were paid and money was distributed. They write, quote, At eleven in the morning, a siren sounded. Everybody gathered up in the factory yard, where a five-ton lorry was drawn up, loaded with paper money. The chief cashier and his assistants climb on top. They read out names and just threw out bundles of notes. 
As soon as you caught one, you made a dash for the nearest shop and bought anything that was going. One of my personal favorite stories illustrates just how worthless the money had become by this point. They write, quote, Two women were carrying a laundry basket filled to the brim with banknotes. Seeing a crowd standing around a shop window, they put down the basket for a moment to see if there was anything they could buy. When they turned back around a few moments later, they found that the money was there untouched, but the basket was gone. One popular story that has been told and retold through the perspectives of numerous people is cafe prices increasing while people are enjoying their coffee. The story usually goes something like this. Someone sits down to enjoy a cup of coffee, and then after finishing their first cup, decides that they want to order a second one. After finishing their second cup of coffee, they ask for their bill. When it arrives, they find that the price of the second cup was more than the price of the first, illustrating just how fast prices were rising at this time. One of the most ominous signs of hyperinflation can be seen in the currency denominations. As prices keep increasing, eventually higher value banknotes need to be printed in order to make purchases feasible. If these new denominations were not printed, then people would physically not be able to carry enough banknotes in order to make any purchases. Just as the new higher value denominations have to be introduced, however, the older lower value denominations have to be retired. The result is that the people who had used these units of currency for their entire lives begin to see them slowly fade away. This happened to the German people most abruptly in July of 1923, whenever the 1,000 mark note was officially decommissioned. Before the war, the 1,000 mark note was the highest denomination available. Its decommissioning effectively meant that the mark as the German people had known it was completely dead and gone. All that was left now was the new mark, whose value was dropping precipitously each and every day. One of the most fascinating products from this period are the pictures that were taken. It's incredibly difficult for us to look back decades after the fact and try to understand what it was like to survive and just live a normal life during this time. However, these pictures provide a glimpse into the despair as well as the absurdity of living under hyperinflation. One of the most famous is a picture of three children standing on what looks like a sidewalk or an alleyway of some kind. In their hands and scattered across the ground are banknotes tied together with rubber bands. In the center of the picture is a tower built out of these banknotes being stacked one on top of the other. If you look a little bit more closely at the picture, you can see that the banknotes that are being bundled up into bricks are the one mark note. Now there's quite a few of these bundled bricks that make up this tower in the picture, 98 of them to be exact. If we estimate that there's around 100 of these notes in each individual brick, that would mean that there's almost 10,000 marks here in this picture. Now from our point of view decades after the fact, you almost can't help but look at this picture and think, well, that money had to be worth something, right? I mean, there's 10,000 marks there that had to have been able to buy something. We don't know the exact date that this picture was taken, so it's difficult to estimate exactly what the value of these marks would have been at that time. However, for the sake of the example, let's just say that this picture was taken sometime in September of 1923. Now, even if we have a rough guesstimate on when the picture might have been taken, another problem arises. Because prices were changing so quickly and all the time, it's difficult to put together an accurate account of what the price of any particular good was at any given point. Even with this in mind, however, we do have some records from the time. One of these records puts the price of bread in September of 1923 at 1,512,000 marks for one loaf. Doing a little bit of quick math, that means that the children in the picture, with their kingly sum of 10,000 marks, would have been able to buy one 150th of a loaf of bread. In other words, the money was completely worthless. Why not let the children build towers out of it? Another famous image from this time is of a man gluing paper banknotes onto a wall. We sometimes use the phrase, not worth the paper it's printed on, to describe inflation. Well, in the case of the German mark, at this point it literally was not worth the paper it was printed on. For any cost-conscious consumers, it would be cheaper for them to simply glue paper banknotes onto their wall than try to buy actual wallpaper. In fact, people found many creative ways to use all of these paper banknotes that were just lying around. Images can be found of people making suits, ball gowns, and all kinds of other clothing out of these banknotes. 
Another unique symptom of hyperinflation that emerged around this time was what was known as zero stroke or cipher stroke. Now, I have to preface this by saying that this was not a rigorously documented phenomenon. Regardless, zero stroke or cipher stroke was a mental affliction caused by constantly writing or reading the number zero. There were a litany of symptoms, symptoms being in quotation marks, that were associated with this phenomenon, which included dizziness, fainting, and mental breakdowns. Again, the documentation on zero stroke or cipher stroke is inconsistent at best, so it's possible that this wasn't a real sickness at all. Either way, having to look at zeros all day long was clearly taking a toll on the German people's mental stability. Now, here would be a good point to finally address a question which I'm sure you've already wondered yourself. Why did they keep printing money? After all, the German government officials weren't blind. They could look around and see the destruction that the hyperinflation was causing to their society, to their political climate, to their economy, and to their culture. If this is true, then why did they keep printing money? Why didn't they just stop? Well, in Ludwig von Mises' book, Omnipotent Government, which we quoted from earlier, he gives us an explanation. He writes, quote, The great German inflation was the result of the monetary doctrines of the socialist of the chair. It had little to do with the course of military and political events. The present writer forecasted it in 1912. The American economist B.M. Anderson confirmed this forecast in 1917. But most of those men who between 1914 and 1923 were in a position to influence Germany's monetary and banking policies and all the journalists, writers, and politicians who dealt with those problems labored under the delusion that an increase in the quantity of banknotes does not affect commodity prices and foreign exchange rates. They blamed the blockade or profiteering for the rise of commodity prices and the unfavorable balance of payments for the rise in foreign exchange rates. They did not lift a finger to stop inflation. Like all pro-inflation parties, they simply wanted to combat the undesirable but inevitable consequences of inflation, i.e. the rise in commodity prices. Their ignorance of economic problems pushed them towards price controls and foreign exchange restrictions. They can never understand why these attempts were doomed to fail. The inflation was neither an act of God nor a consequence of the Treaty of Versailles. It was the practical application of the same etatist ideas that had begotten nationalism. All the German political parties shared a responsibility for the inflation. They all clung to the air that it was not the increase of bank credits, but the unfavorable balance of payments that was devaluing the currency. In other words, the inflation continued because it was politically expedient. Whenever the inevitable consequences of this inflation started to manifest themselves, however, they either blamed it on something else or chose to ignore it altogether. They either couldn't see, or simply chose not to see, the consequences of endless money printing. As we previously saw, the consequences of this money printing are not limited just to rising prices. It affects every other aspect of life. Whenever it comes to running a business, for instance, even the most simple aspects of buying and selling goods are made exponentially more difficult. In an environment whenever prices are changing all the time, how do you know what the price of a particular good should be? Moreover, how do you make any contracts with your suppliers? By the time you receive any goods that you've bought, the price of those goods has already increased. And whenever the value of money is constantly changing, how can you tell if your business is even making a profit or a loss? Even under hyperinflation, businesses still have to operate. They did their best to adapt, and had to invent some clever tricks in order to do so. For instance, Ferguson records that during this time, many businesses automatically included sliding clauses into their contracts. The purpose of these sliding clauses was that prices would be automatically adjusted for inflation. While it was difficult to tell exactly what prices would be at some point in the future, particularly if this future was several months removed from whenever the contract was being written, they guessed as best they could. Another way that businesses would deal with increasing prices was through the use of price indexes. These indexes were essentially a list for the prices of various goods, and they would be published daily in newspapers and posted on bulletin boards. Even this, however, was only a partial solution, as even the prices published in these indexes could quickly become obsolete throughout the day. 
One of the best resources on the ways that businesses adapted to hyperinflation is a paper by Sebastian Hoffman and Stephen P. Walker called Adapting to Crisis, Accounting Information Systems During the Weimar Hyperinflation. In this paper, they detail some of the challenges that businesses faced in their day-to-day -day operations, as well as the solutions that they had to invent in order to get around them. For instance, Hoffman and Walker record that in 1923, whenever the inflation truly transformed into hyperinflation, many businesses stopped quoting prices in German marks and started quoting them in foreign currencies instead. Now, doing this does add a step in the transaction process, as instead of just paying the price in marks, the price has to first be translated from the foreign currency into German marks. However, doing this does prevent having to change prices each and every day. Just as increasing prices cause problems for businesses, increasing wages cause problems as well. Hoffman and Walker write, quote, Frequent changes to employment contracts are necessary to adjust salaries and pensions. By way of illustration, the monthly gross salary of Mr. Albrecht, a white-collar worker with a paper manufacturer Klubler and Nighthammer, increased from 2,400 paper marks in January of 1922 to 9,534,684,695,000,000 marks in November of 1923. Having to constantly change and adjust these employment contracts took a lot of work. However, these calculational problems weren't unique to just paying out wages. Many institutions, including most banks, had to employ many labor hours just for the purposes of calculating interest payments and foreign exchange transactions. Because of the unimaginably large numbers that hyperinflation produces, it became difficult for businesses to even record basic routine information. As a result, some businesses just gave up. They stopped trying to keep track of cash flow or accounting of any kind. For these businesses, they were effectively operating blind, without any details as to the financial status of their day-to-day -day operations. However, the effects of hyperinflation were not limited just to business and finance. We've already discussed the numerous ways that hyperinflation impacted the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary people, but hyperinflation also meant the slow deterioration and dissolution of German society. Hyperinflation wasn't just some nuisance, but a critical threat that attacked the social fabric holding the nation together. Over the course of 1923, this social fabric would be stretched to the absolute breaking point. One of the most insightful views on the Weimar hyperinflation can be found in a book by Conrad Haydn called Der Führer, Hitler's Rise to Power. Haydn's book is largely on the fall of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Adolf Hitler. It's with that end state in mind that he writes on the German hyperinflation. Concerning the effect that inflation had on German society, he says, quote, The German people was one of the first to witness the decay of those material values which a whole century had taken as the highest of all values. The German nation was one of the first to experience the death of the unlimited free property which had lent such a royal pride to modern humanity. Money had lost its value. What, then, could have any value? Of course, many were accustomed to having no money, but that even with money you had nothing, that was a twilight of the gods, as horrible as anything Wagner could have foreseen. When a mark was no longer a mark, the period of nihilism foreseen by Nietzsche seemed to be at hand. First, the Kaiser had gone, then the silver coins with his likeness had gone, and unknown faces, sometimes distorted by frightful grimaces of eccentric artists, stared at you from worthless paper notes. The world's aim was changing. A cynical frivolity penetrated men's souls. No one knew what he really possessed, and some men wondered what they really were. This could not be compared to any depreciation of the currency in the past, with the Azignats of the French Revolution, for example. For at that time, the mass of real property was not touched by the depreciation. But in modern times, wealth consists largely of claims and credits, which have values only so long as the state protects them and secures them. Men understood this with terrible clarity when the state stopped securing their wealth. What Haydn is drawing attention to here is that the destruction of the German mark didn't just affect the value of the money, but the German people's very conception of what it meant to be German. They had seen their military fail in the Great War. They had seen their leader, the Kaiser, deposed, and now they had seen their money, one of their objects of national pride, become worthless. Furthermore, they had been thrust into falling standards of living and increased poverty as a result. If you were a German living at this time, what did you have left to feel proud of? Even if you had nothing to be proud of, what did you have left to hold on to?
You had lost the Great War, your government had been deposed, and now your money was worthless. You had less food in your cupboards now than you did nine years ago, and you had to live through the constant chaotic white noise of hyperinflation. Haydn writes, quote, Man had measured himself by money. His worth had been measured by money. Through money he was someone, or at least hoped to become someone. Men had come and gone, risen and fallen, but money was permanent and immortal. Now the state had managed to kill this immortal thing. The state was the conqueror and the successor of money, and thus the state was everything. Man looked down at himself and saw that he was nothing. One of the most compelling personal accounts from someone actually living at this time can be found in Erna von Prostow and her book, How It Happens. Scattered throughout her book are small insights into how people lived during this time and how they adapted to the circumstances around them. In one passage, she writes, quote, well, I was, as you know, rather sentimental and romantic, and I too waited for the great love to come, yet that I would not have even dared to confess to myself. Besides, I had more urgent worries. Day after day, I became more aware of the discrepancy between the things I learned at school and read in beautiful books and the realities of life. What Prustow hints at here is the same nihilism mentioned by Haydn. Attitudes towards the present were almost completely negative, and attitudes towards the future were even more negative still. Furthermore, this nihilism was just seen as the new status quo, or as Prostow says it, the realities of life. In another passage, Prostow deals with the romantic consequences of inflation. She writes, quote, You know, at that time, many a daughter of good families ran away with a man, and more than one natural child was born in the circle of the family. This was not only the aftermath of the war, it was due even more to inflation. The daughters of good families could no longer get dowries. Yet the young men who came home from war were not on solid footing, and they were more than ever dependent on dowries if they wanted to marry. I suppose it's fitting, just as every other institution in German society was destroyed, that the institution of marriage should be destroyed as well. And Prostow is very explicit here as to why this is the case. It wasn't just because times were tough after the war, it was because of the inflation. Because of the cost of a dowry, marriage was seen as too expensive. The result? People just didn't get married. While this might have seemed fairly innocuous at first, the consequences of these lack of stable relationships made itself manifest in the years to come. Prostow's work gives us a good individual look at the social consequences of hyperinflation. For an even deeper look on the effects of hyperinflation on society, we turn to a paper by Joe Salerno, titled Hyperinflation and the Destruction of the Human Personality. Salerno makes the important point that man's identity is inevitably tied up with the property in his possession. Hyperinflation, however, distorts this property. Salerno writes, quote, Inflation does not just wipe out the savings of the productive classes and divert their energies into sterile and corrupt pursuits, however. It also deforms and accentuates their personalities. Whether we like it or not, men and women exist in a world where they cannot live and flourish either physically or spiritually without property. As the founder of the Austrian school, Karl Menger, pointed out, property is not an arbitrarily combined quantity of goods, but a direct reflection of a person's needs, an integrated whole, no essential part of which can be diminished or increased without affecting realization of the end that it serves. Thus, property is the foundation of human personality. No meaningful notion, activity, or external expression of inner being is possible without it. For human personality is not the spontaneous projection into the outer world of random inner urges that characterizes the unreflective behavior of a human infant. Personality is the external projection of a deliberately planned mode of individual being and becoming. As such, it involves a self-conscious arrangement of activities whose pursuit requires a carefully chosen structure of means, i.e. property. Property is therefore not a haphazard collection of things that can be completely described in physical terms, but rather the coherent, objective embodiment of the yearnings and aspirations of the human spirit. In a real sense, then, property defines and delimits an individual's personality. One cannot be whatever he wants to be. He is rigidly limited by the means at his disposal. One is not truly a physician, software engineer, or restaurateur unless he can acquire the requisite complementary goods for producing that product or service. Nor can one even consistently pursue leisure or vocational activities without possessing specific concrete means. Thus, one is not a fisherman without fishing tackle and access to a boat and a body of water. 
and one is not a golfer or a gardener without the possession of, or the means of acquiring, the needed complementary golfing equipment or gardening tools. As Salerno points out, people manifest their personalities into the external world. The way in which they do so is through their property. If, however, this property is distorted or unable to be acquired, then it limits the expression of that personality. To borrow Salerno's example, you can't be a fisherman if you don't have fishing tackle, a boat, and a body of water. What happens if that fishing tackle or the boat is unavailable? Well, then the fisherman can no longer be a fisherman. As a result, that element of his personality is destroyed. What happens when a businessman cannot acquire the goods he needs to sell? Or what happens if he can no longer accurately set prices for those goods? Or, going back to Prostow's writings, what happens when it's too expensive for the husband to get married? He never becomes a husband at all. Whenever people lose these elements of identity, they lose parts of what characterize them as themselves. While elements of identity can always be replaced, this doesn't happen quickly, nor does it happen easily. And doing so effectively means that the old conception of self, the person who you were beforehand, has now been altered. By 1923, so many elements of identity for the German people had already been taken away. Their military pride had been trampled, their government had been deposed, and now the mark, the symbol of national wealth, was completely destroyed. And with the hyperinflation's destruction and restriction of property, now their individual sense of personality was being assaulted as well. The destruction of these sources of identity can be psychologically lethal. Human beings inherently need to know who they are so that they can know how to act. Without any sense of identity, the only thing that's left is this deep, fundamental sense of angst, of not knowing who you are or what you should do. It should be unsurprising, then, that when faced with these circumstances, the German people looked for solutions. Specifically, they were looking for a way out of this crisis as well as someone to blame. Thus, whoever claimed to have answers for the German people, the German people were willing to listen. We've already mentioned that around this time, a young man by the name of Adolf Hitler was starting to make a name for himself. Ferguson records that it was in 1923 whenever Hitler made his way to the forefront of the public consciousness. Up to this point, the nationalist movement in Germany had been mostly dominated by German government officials and army officers from the Great War. Whenever hyperinflation became the only issue on everyone's mind, Hitler was much more adept at speaking to these economic issues than many of the other nationalist leaders. Thus, Hitler became one of the pillars of the right wing in Germany, and more and more people were flocking to his banner. Erna von Prostow points out that it was hyperinflation that created the appetite for Hitler and his message. She writes, quote, Inflation finished the process of moral decay which the war had started. It was a slow process over a decade or more, so slow that it really smelled of a slow death. It gives the whole picture of Germany and all its ugliness, and it undermined the Republic of Weimar. When inflation was over, the psychological preparation for fascism was complete. The minds of the people were prepared for the Nazis. Ludwig von Mises, writing in Omnipotent Government, agrees. He writes, quote, The inflation had pauperized the middle class. The victims joined Hitler. But they did not do so because they had suffered, but because they believed Nazism would relieve them. That a man suffers from bad digestion does not explain why he consults a quack. He consults the quack because he thinks the man will cure him. If he had other opinions, he would consult a doctor. That there was economic distress in Germany does not account for Nazism's success. Other parties also, e.g. the Social Democrats and the Communists, recommended their patent medicines. Anti-Semitism had been on the rise in Germany ever since the end of the Great War. Much of this was the result of the famous stab in the back myth, which stated that it was Jewish influences which undermined the German home front which led to the loss in the Great War. One of the most staunch promoters of this myth was none other than Erich Ludendorff, the German commander-in-chief of the army at the end of the Great War. Of course, it would be rather convenient for him if the reason Germany lost the war was not because of his own military failings, but rather because the Jews undermined Germany's willingness to keep fighting. Regardless, anti-Semitic feelings only increased in 1921 and 1922 in the ramp-up to hyperinflation. 
As we saw in Ludwig von Mises' writings from earlier, it wasn't widely understood by the public that it was money printing that was causing the inflation. Just as some people blamed inflation on the balance of payments, other people blamed it on the money changers, which more often than not was just a euphemism for the Jews. Hitler picked up on these sentiments and carried them forward, becoming the face of extreme German nationalism. Again, people were looking for solutions to the chaos around them. Whenever they listened to Hitler speak, he sounded like a man that had these solutions. The result was that they bought into Hitler's ideology and all of the darkness that accompanied it. As the star of Hitler burned brighter and brighter, in November of 1923, he decided it was time to make his move. The result was the Munich, or sometimes called the Beer Hall, Putsch. On November 8, 1923, a large contingent of 2,000 Nazi party members tried to storm the Munich city center, but were beaten back by local police forces. Sixteen Nazi party members and four police officers were killed in the fighting. Soon afterwards, Hitler would be arrested, tried, and convicted on charges of treason. He was sentenced to five years in prison, a shockingly low sentence for one convicted of treason. However, he would end up serving only a little over a year of that sentence before being released. Even so, his time in prison would prove formative for his own development as well as the future of the German nation, for it was during his time in prison that he wrote the infamous Mein Kampf. After being released from prison, he would spend the next few years trying to rebuild the Nazi party, which had been shattered after the failed Munich Putsch. Eventually, the German hyperinflation did come to an end. It did not do so easily or quickly, however. By the beginning of October, one British pound was equal to one billion marks. By the end of October, it would drop to 800 billion. At this point, farmers in the German countryside had decided they had enough of worthless paper money. Many of them stopped exchanging their produce for marks altogether. If you wanted to transact with them, you had to barter with them directly, or maybe use some kind of foreign currency. The predictable result was that food was becoming increasingly scarce in urban areas. This had the effect of further exacerbating rising food prices. By mid-November, one pound was worth well over one trillion German marks. It was at this point, however, that a relief attempt was finally launched. The damage being caused by hyperinflation was simply too great. As a result, a plan for a new currency was hatched. This new currency would be called the written mark. The conversion rate for the mark to the written mark would be 1 trillion to 1. While the plan for the written mark had been proposed and taken some time to iron out the details, it was eventually launched on November 15th. The German people could go to their local banks and exchange their marks for written marks at the aforementioned exchange rate of 1 trillion to 1. However, the written mark in itself was something of a gamble. If you'll remember from earlier, there's a difference between gold marks and paper marks. Paper marks were just that, pieces of paper. Gold marks, however, were claims on gold that could theoretically be redeemed at any time. In order to try to build up public confidence in the written mark, the written mark itself was tied to gold. In other words, it was an attempt to bring back the gold marks of previous years. Even though the written mark could be redeemed for gold, the German banking system did not have nearly enough gold to cover every single written mark. In other words, if the holders of the new written marks decided that they wanted their gold instead of this dubious paper currency, then the German banking system would run out of gold far before all of the claims could be paid out. While there was this risk in order to stop the hyperinflation, it was a risk that they had to take. Ultimately, it was a risk that would pay off. The German people were so eager for any relief to the hyperinflation that they were willing to hold on to these new written marks. Very few, if any of them at all, were turned in for their gold counterparts. As more and more marks were traded in for written marks, and the written marks started to circulate, prices began to stabilize. For the first time in nearly a decade, inflation was decreasing instead of increasing in Germany. By the end of 1923, food started reappearing in cities as farmers started to trust the value of the written mark. Slowly but surely, life started to return to normal or as normal as things could be in the new post-war era. Of course, however, not all was well. 
One of the main reasons that the inflation had continued for so long was that the government preferred to inflate the currency than tax the people. Now that inflation was off the table for good, the government had to both cut spending and raise taxes. Not an insignificant amount of discontent was caused by this, but the government officials had little choice. While the German economy was improving, it was still a shadow of a shadow of its former self. Unemployment skyrocketed after the introduction of the Rittenmark, largely because the hyperinflation could no longer plaster over the poor state of economic affairs. This development would be accelerated by the collapse of Hugo Stein's business empire. Steins was one of the wealthiest industrialists in all of Germany. He was in control of over 4,500 businesses and 3,000 manufacturing plants. He passed away in April 1924, and his entire corporate empire would collapse just several months later. While it's difficult to know the total number of employees he had at the time of his death, one estimate puts it around 600,000. Just for reference, that means that almost 1% of Germany's total population was employed by Steins. When his business conglomerate collapsed just a few months after his death, almost all of those 600,000 employees were now out of a job. Even though they were these and many other road bumps ahead, the German nation was finally on the path of healing and recovery. One of my personal favorite artistic movements is what's known as German Expressionism. While the dates surrounding these type of things are always somewhat vague, it came about in the early 1920s and was popular for the better part of a decade. German Expressionism is typified by several different features, including an emphasis on the artist's own personal feelings and perception, as well as a general view that the world is distorted or not as it should be. These feelings of distortion apply not only to individuals, but to society at large. This applies most poignantly to those in positions of power and authority, believing them to be unjust and undeserving of their stations in life. Now, it should be no surprise that this artistic movement came into vogue around this time. With everything that had happened over the past decade, including the Great War, the overthrow of the Kaiser and creation of the Weimar Republic, the occupation of the Ruhr, and a whirlwind of hyperinflation, how could they not feel as if the world had lost all sense and order? However, as difficult as it was, they still had to put the pieces back together and try to make something of the rest of their lives. By the mid-1920s, things were improving. The economy was starting to get back on track, and inflation was finally under control. Several years later, however, came the 1929 stock market crash and the ensuing Great Depression. All of the anger, the animus, and the discontent that had been created after the war came roaring back. The German people felt as if they had been beaten down for the past 20 years with little respite. They then became willing to give themselves over to anyone who could give them a sense of order, a sense that they could be proud of themselves again. Unfortunately, that man would turn out to be Adolf Hitler. Hitler had sharpened his rhetoric during the hyperinflation years, and in the early 1930s, he wielded that rhetoric to mesmerizing success. The popularity of the Nazi party started to grow again, and even though Hitler had tried to overthrow the government just a decade earlier, in 1932, German President Paul von Hindenburg selected Hitler to be the chancellor. After the infamous Reichstag fire, Hitler was granted emergency powers. These emergency powers more or less cemented him as a dictator, and these powers would never be given up. Within a few years' time, Hitler had become the Führer, the unrivaled ruler of all of Germany. And the rest, as they say, is history. Let me emphasize, it will not be costless to stop it, but it will not be costless to continue what we're doing. If I may conclude with, a medical, with my medical analogy, if you're sick, it's very, very seldom that a doctor can give you a cure which will enable you to rise from your bed the next man, a whole, the next day, a whole person, completely unaffected by your illness. We have a disease called inflation. Fortunately, our basic constitution is strong. 
This is a strong, healthy country, although we've been doing our best to make it unhealthy. We've been doing our best to take measures that will reduce our productivity. But nonetheless, we're still a pretty strong, healthy country. And there's nothing basically wrong with us. But we have been suffering from a self-imposed disease of inflation. Sooner or later, I am sure we will get up the will to cure it. But we shall not cure it or continue it without paying a price either way. Thank you.